been a product manager or more senior for 47 years uh, across uh, I forget, like eight companies, eight startups, uh, 25 different organizations. I've brought to market uh, over 75 products in SaaS and software, hardware, services, uh, and so forth. Uh, and if I do now what I did not know back then, I would not have made all the mistakes that I made. And I just uh, got a contract uh, last year uh, with, uh, and I can do a little bit more of my background, uh, with uh, Wiley and Sutton, which, which is one of the world's oldest and largest uh, book publishers, uh, to do a, a, a book on what I've called the foundations of the successful management of products. And I deliberately left the term product manager out of there because much beyond Silicon Valley, most people don't understand what a product manager is and what they do. And many of us, uh, let's see a show of hands, how many people go to a cocktail party and they ask you what you do and you say I'm a product manager and their eyes really go over and they walk away from you. <laughs> so um, the key issue here, I think, is the successful management of products in everybody in an organization. I say an organization because the principles I'm talking about here apply to nonprofits, it applies to government, uh, it applies to uh, business contractors, but there they call the product managers program directors. All of the same principles apply, and they also apply whether it's B2B or B2C. And I'll talk more about the differences between B2B and B2C later. So I got my uh, training uh, as a product manager at uh, Hewlett Packard. Uh, I had the opportunity to personally handle the PR for uh, Dave Packard uh, in the corporate uh, public relations office. And then because that was the only department in HP at the time that knew how to type, I deployed an internal HP uh, mini computer uh, word processing program. Uh, and as a, as a result of that, one of the nice things at HP in those days is that you could move horizontally. So I was able to move over into product management at, uh, at the office systems group, responsible for word processing, spreadsheets, uh, presentation software, graphics, databases, and stuff like that. And I went through all of Fred Gibbons' videos that he had recorded that he was at HP. And Fred Gibbons later went on and did uh, the Office 2 software company called Software Publishing, and now he's a professor up at Stanford. And Apple recruited me uh, after being at HP for a while to be a product manager at Apple because the people at Apple understood the value of product managers. And so for my book, uh, both Don't Get Sailing Great Products, which all of you can get a free copy of as soon as I finish self-publishing it on Amazon, um, uh, and for Foundations of the Successful Management of the Product, I went back and studied the history of product management, and I'll talk more about that uh, this morning. Uh, and, or this afternoon, and uh, uh, one of the key things that the professor talked about this morning, uh, two things that I disagree with him on. One is uh, the way Procter & Gamble does brand management, and he's right, brand management came from Procter & Gamble to HP via Stanford and Fred Turbin, who was the mentor to the six founders of, of HP, uh, and also um, that guy, Neil McElroy, that wrote that memo on product management, at uh, Procter & Gamble, I think it was 1932, uh, was on an advisory board to Stanford. And he later went on to become uh, the Deputy uh, the Department of Defense uh, uh, Secretary under uh, the last two years of President Eisenhower's uh, term. So this, every president of Procter & Gamble since then uh, has come out of brand management. Well, the former VP of Innovation at Procter & Gamble uh, gave a lecture, and it's up on the Carnegie Mellon website, and says they don't believe in focus groups at Dr. Gamble. They don't believe in surveys, they don't believe in interviews, because people can't tell you what they want. What they do is they go out and they observe. So the key thing that I've learned from studying that, and also studying uh, Tony Ulrich's work up at Synergy in San Francisco, Tony says people have to do jobs. And if you find out what is the job that they're trying to do, that could then be outcome-driven innovation. And you've written a paper on that, and it's in the Harvard Business Review. I had a chance last month to meet Tony, and I noticed that he had worked on the IBM PC Junior, which was an abysmal disaster. I was at Apple, 
at the same time, and nobody could figure out what that computer was for. And I said, what did you do? He says, I was a manufacturer. He says, because of that failure, that's why he started uh, Synergy and started talking about outcome-driven innovation. I argue that you need to go further and not go as the second point that the professor this morning talked about. He talked about you have to have customer acceptance, certainly, but that's after the product has been built. And the key to building the right product that's going to be successful is to focus entirely on what is the outcome, what is the value that you want your customer or your customer wants to accomplish. What do they want to do? What do they do? When do they do it? How do they do it? Where do they do it? Why do they do it? And if you can answer those questions first by observing what they do, and you do the observations just like a social anthropologist, you don't stick yourself into the scene. You just observe, and you record that. You can then use that to write your interview questionnaire to go out and interview more people. And then you can use the responses to those questions to write your surveys. And then you take your surveys and pick a representative sample of who your target market might be. And then you run that survey against that representative sample. And then you are able to predict what the sales of the product is going to be. The second thing Tony talks about is you don't prioritize on the basis of what you think is the most important, which they teach around this product category. You also have to look at what your customers do, those are my words, and he says, how satisfied are they with the current solution? So you can come up with a different ways of scaling this because what you're essentially doing is multiplying importance times satisfaction, taking those numbers and then rank them from the top to the bottom in order to prioritize the values that you're working on. Notice I did not say features. Patel, a uh, market research firm, uh, says that in 2014, the world spent about, what was it, $1.6 trillion on product development. And somewhere between 35 and 45% of those products fail. Now, you've heard at this conference and in the, on, on the web, uh, a lot of product management consulting companies say 80 to 95% fail. There was a study of all of those claims that it turned out was were pretty much self-serving claims. And there's a study out uh, that and it's on my website in the to that study. It says about 35 to 45% of all products that are developed fail. So the world wastes between a half a trillion to three quarters of a trillion dollars. And my goal in my life, uh, I'm uh, turned 65 in July, is to retire. And if I could leave behind a little bit of knowledge. Uh, that folks like you could use to reduce those trillions of dollars that are being wasted so society can become more productive, then I'll be happy. The microphone works now, by the way. Oh, good. Um, I spent some time with the 280 group and helped write their optimal product management course, uh, the three-day course. And I traveled around the world delivering that. And one of the things they talk about is you have to look at the process, uh, the information, and uh, the strategy. And as I thought about this and wrote the 850 pages for Foundations of the Successful Management of Products, which is going to come out uh, as a seven-volume set uh, and, and over covering 130 topics, is that there's actually three more things that we need to consider in terms of success. And you, it just turns out it comes out to be a nice acronym called SPICES to uh, help you remember uh, what it's all about. So the first part of it is strategy. And I talked about the importance of doing the do, understanding the do. And then you use that to come up with your innovation of how you're going to help your customer do what it is that they want to do better. Uh, as opposed to ideation. And Tony points out that most products satisfy roughly 15 unmet needs. And if you multiply the whole thing out, in order to discover through brainstorming the potential for satisfying uh, or identifying those unmet needs, you have to uh, come up with about, uh, I think it was 14 million ideas. Then you've got to sift through your those 14 million ideas and try to find the five that are uh, prospective customers find solutions that are unsatisfactory. I propose to you, you don't have the time or the money 
uh, to come up with all of that. And we see a lot of startups coming up with these, what they think are brilliant ideas, and they haven't gone out and talked and observed uh, their primary targeted customers. Uh, and they have, and as a result of that, they run out of money before they finally get to the 14 million ideas that they need to generate. So that's what I talk about in terms of innovation. And I share with you in there some thoughts from Tom Kelly of uh, IDEO. Uh, Tom's firm, IDEO, uh, designed my product, the Apple III. Uh, and uh, also have in there uh, Helmut, uh, I can never pronounce his last name. He was the principal designer for Apple uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, and uh, coincidentally enough, I was there in the room when he uh, unveiled the Snow White look, which is the look of most of the Apple products, including the one we've got right there, that Apple is, uh, is using today. Uh, and, uh, so, and I brought out some of the first products using the uh, Snow White look. Also in that room, of course, was Steve Jobs and my counterparts uh, at Apple. And I had no idea how important it is. And this is one of the reasons that Product managers typically get pulled apart by six horses. Uh, some people want product managers to go be product designers or uh, <coughs> product architects or user experience uh, designers or UX designers. And this, of course, is here, teaching people about UX design. Uh, I remember I was teaching Capital One Bank, all their digital people in Richmond, Virginia. They're the fifth largest bank in the world. And uh, one of the students said, uh, they're asking me to do, to do wireframes. Uh, should I continue doing that? I said, absolutely not. Because as you look at the things I'm about to show you on this slide and on the next slide, if you're not doing these things, then no one's putting together the product market plan or the product market strategy. And whatever you come up with in your wireframes doesn't make a difference. So you have to run away from those uh, free positions and focus on product management. You're also not a project manager. You're also not a uh, uh, product owner. Uh, stay away from those kinds of things and explain to your management uh, what it is that needs to be done. And if you need help on that, uh, I've got a free presentation you can take, customized for your environment. It's up on the Spice Catalyst website. And you can use that to, to pitch to your management. So the next thing that goes into the product market strategy is the value proposition. You notice that's coming up really early. It's not waiting until after the product is done and then you try to go out and figure out what, this, what value this thing has out in the marketplace. Then the next thing that needs to be done is the market research, which is the things I just talked about earlier, and the competitive research. And what you don't do is copy the features of the uh, other competitors. Uh, part of the reason for this is the following. I was in Shanghai a few years ago teaching the Cisco product management team uh, for uh, the Shanghai uh, operation and all the product managers for WebEx. WebEx developed and managed uh, Soju uh, China. And they asked me about what's going on uh, in terms of competing with Huawei, or Huawei, which is the big uh, Chinese government funded and partially owned uh, competitor in Cisco. I said, here's what you do. You put together a roadmap that says you're going over there, when in reality, you're going over there. And you take it and present it to your biggest customer that's also a customer of Huawei. And I'll bet you by the end of the day, that roadmap will be in the hands of Huawei. Yeah. And they'll copy that. And they'll go over there, and you're going over there. And the Chinese, I was amazed, they said, that's ethical? I said, I'm in China, what are you talking about? I wrote the book, it's called The Art of War. I was required to read The Art of War when I became a product manager at, uh, at HP. IBM deployed their strategy regarding <coughs> FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's, it's a deception. And you kind of got to do that sometimes. So a few months later, I was in Botswana teaching the Botswani and telecommunications company. And I went to Botswana because I wanted to figure out how did they get a country northeast of South Africa? Just physically, that doesn't make sense. And uh, one of the ladies in the uh, in my product management class there said, uh, excuse me, but I am the largest buyer of Huawei equipment at BTC. And uh, how long ago did you tell them to do that? <laughs> <laughs> the next thing you do in the product market strategy is the personas that you are targeting. Now, personas typically come from the marketing side. I propose they can also be used in the product development side. 
And that's the vision of the customer that your engineers have when they're building the product. But if you nail that down first and you tell them what it is, then they know who they're building the product for. Also, in terms of that market research, you can now use keywords because people are searching for solutions to the problems. They're searching for their do's on the internet. So you can use keyword research, which you later need for your social media marketing in your product uh, development in terms of identifying the personas that you choose to uh, target. Then the next thing you have to do is your product positioning. Not like what we talked at the 280 group was, just pick any two axes and it doesn't matter uh, in order to position yourself on that campus different from someone else. It does matter. Do the positioning based upon the value propositions that you identify in step number three. And so you might use a radar chart and have five, six, seven, eight types of things. And then from that, you could then write your positioning statement which is not your messaging platform, it's just your positioning statement. Then you can finally put together your feature advantages and benefits chart. Now that was one of the things that we always had to do at HP, and that was not easy to do. What's the difference between an advantage and a benefit? Uh, I argue you add two more columns to that chart on the left-hand side. What is the problem, and what are they trying to do? So then when you look at the description of the feature, you understand what it's all about. And you also do your roadmap in terms of the value, not in terms of the feature. It's hard to understand what the feature is. Uh, when I was at DataQuest uh, running the uh, personal computer industry service, I would frequently go to a trade show and ask, uh, uh, walk into a booth and ask somebody, uh, what do you do here? And the salesperson would say, everything. So he just wasted his time and my time. And I could look at all of the um, signs to try to understand what the company's product is, what it does, what it would do for the customer, what it would do for me, what its positioning is. And frequently you read these things, you have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. And they pretend they do everything. And that comes because this kind of features, advantages, and benefits chart was put together, if it was put together earlier by the product management team, uh, was not clear on that, nor was it clear on the positioning. Then you do the prioritization, then you start rolling up the personas from the bottom up into your target markets, and then you do your, and along with your target market, your total available market, uh, and then your product roadmap. Then you got to think of your channel. I was at an Apple reunion uh, back in 2014, and the first VP of sales, Gene Carter, said to me, you know, we put together a sales force at Apple to sell uh, the Apple II through the same channels that they used to sell uh, integrated circuits through uh, National Semiconductor. Then they came out with the Apple III, and that was for the small business and the home office market, so they had to get a whole new sales force. Then they came out with the Lisa, and that was for the office business, office market, so they had to do a whole new sales force. And then they came out with the Macintosh, that's the computer for the rest of us, so they had to come up with a rest of us kind of sales force. Four different sales forces in six years. They didn't have, they never thought in terms of their product development, and I was partly guilty for that, in terms of the availability of the channel and leveraging the channel and the channel relationships. So when you green light a product, and there's a free uh, green lighting product checklist up at the Spice Catalyst website, go down that checklist, and one of those things on that checklist is does that product, in terms of the targeted personas of the customers, does your current channel fit? building and sanding great products is the process. The process has to be repeatable. You have to use a good framework. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about Daisy and Racy. You need to have, you need to know who's responsible for making the decisions. Uh, when I was in Botswana, uh, one of the product managers came there from uh, Johannesburg, or as they call it, Joburg, because they don't like to say the whole word. Uh, they, uh, uh, and he said he just got a call, it's like the second day of the class, uh, from uh, someone in his company and said they just shut down his product line. Uh, and his team had been working for 18 months on it. And I'm sure those engineers are just devastated. They'll probably end up being in the company. Uh, and I asked him, did you have a racy chart? And I'll show you that in a moment. And he said, no. And I said, what happened? He said, well, the company hired, hired a new um, general manager. And she had nothing to do with that product. 
but she convinced the president to cancel the product line. I said, if you had a, a Racy or Daisy chart, would her name have been on there? And he said, no, she wouldn't have. So I said, what you got to do in order to solve this problem is next time make sure you have this and have everybody sign it in blood. And, uh, uh, and then you could go back to the president and say, wait a minute, how come you're listening to her? She's not even on the decision tree. She's not the decision maker, she's not a contributor, she's not being informed, uh, and so forth. And uh, so if you're not using that, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a, few, a little bit later, um, you've got a major problem. There, there's an example of one. How many people use this? If you don't use it, it may be your job. Because they'll blame you. Because you're the one responsible for the product line. So get agreement on this in the beginning. And like you see up here, uh, have them sign it in blood. The next thing that's important is you have the right information at the right time. You have a dashboard so you can monitor the progress of your product through the product uh, framework, the product lifecycle. How many people have a dashboard? Uh, one of my students in India, uh, and they are a platinum uh, Jira uh, developer, uh, wrote a plugin called Product Eyes. And uh, I'll show you the last slide where you can get that free and use it for a year and give us some feedback. Uh, and it, this is the dashboard. So it has all of the components of the product lifecycle in there. And you can uh, customize it to your company's product website. And you can see there's a little small here where it shows some uh, green. That shows that that task is completely completed. It also, on each of these tasks, there's, of course, you can attach documents to it. So we've attached uh, Excel spreadsheets, uh, Google Docs, Word Docs, <coughs> and so forth. So when the sales force needs to have the latest sales presentation, they know where to go to find it, rather than going out to make the sale using the wrong document, and so forth. And then there's the uh, product framework. How many people here uh, picked up the 2A group uh, optimal product management in your bags? And if you want to take those out, and if you picked up Pragmatics uh, framework, I looked at them when I started writing my book. And uh, adaptive marketing is another one, and two or three others. And here's what it's missing. One is the digital transformation. Everything is going in a digital direction. You heard a lot of talk about that this morning. I don't see anything related to that on the, these frameworks. So we will skip that. You'll miss that. What's also missing is uh, the customer journey. And the customer journey is becoming more and more important. Uh, how many people here know the customer journey? We have a description of customer journey up on the Spice Catalyst website. And that's from do nothing to making a recommendation to somebody. There's seven steps that everybody goes through. And it doesn't matter whether it's a B2C or B2B. That's not on there. Another thing that is missing big time is agile. The uh, OPM framework was an adapted version of AIPMM's framework. How many people are familiar with AIPMM? Uh, and they uh, sponsored the publication of the Prodbox of Knowledge. Uh, how many people are familiar with that? About a $50 book you can buy it on Amazon. It tells you what you need to do. It doesn't tell you how to do it. Uh, and that's where those frameworks come from. It's missing agile. That's almost mentioned as an afterthought. Innovation, these frameworks are missing. Uh, social media is not even on. And uh, it's also missing a messaging platform, which is important that you put that together, and then you hand that to your Marcom group or your advertising agency or your PR agency and let them do the wordsmithing on that messaging platform. Nothing about end of life. Uh, a week ago last Saturday, my Comcast modem stopped working. Just stopped. And you do the usual thing, you know, you rub your head and scratch your tummy uh, and unplug the thing and plug it back in. Then you call customer service, they say unplug it, plug it back in. Uh, and went on and on and on, I think about three and a half hours. And then they said, sorry, we'll send somebody out. I said, wait a minute, I've seen this uh, um, 
movie before. They'll come out Thursday. This is a Saturday. I got to have internet access. The problem is not with my internet connection. We've already replaced all the cables uh, between me and the central office because I had to do that. I, I called 15 times because my internet kept going down. And the other way I could get the networking side, which nobody can talk to at Comcast, uh, to look at it is they probably looked at their spreadsheets and says, how come it costs so much to provide service in this uh, complex in, in Saratoga? Let's go out and figure out why. Meanwhile, I was consulting with Cisco Service. I said, you've got the data on all the modems so that it tells you that I have a, a ranging data timeout or something like that, which meant there was interference in the line someplace and it happened every time it rained. So you had to weatherize the thing. So I don't need to wait to get this thing to work for you to send the tech out. I know what I'm talking about. And then he says, oh, wait a minute, let me check something. He went and checked something, and it turned out that I had one of the original Motorola surfboard modems. And uh, Motorola sold off that portion of the business to Aris, A-R-R-I-S, and stopped supporting them. So Comcast, by themselves, made the unilateral decision to shut down anybody using Comcast Internet if they had one of those modems. I said, why didn't you tell me? that I needed to go out and buy a modem. Okay, I had it six years. I could, so, you know, it ends up costing me like 12 bucks, uh, you know, $7 modem over six years. But why didn't you tell me? That's part of the customer journey that Comcast was not paying attention to. That's the end of life kind of thing. And you think I'll tell a good story about Comcast at any of these? You know, I'll tell at least 10 people about how bad Comcast <laughs> service is, except they happen to have a monopoly and I can't go anyplace else. <laughs> And the last thing that's missing from these frameworks is operations. Uh, this is an issue of support. Where's support on those frameworks? And where the product managers got to be marshalling the entire customer journey such that when you get to the support types of issues like you just had, uh, you, or I just had with Comcast, uh, they know that all of the systems and procedures in the support service area is being, being taken care of. Uh, Give you uh, one quick story on, on Apple. I bought Apple Care on my uh, my Mac and uh, had difficulty the other day with something and uh, called up Apple Care. We tried to troubleshoot it. Uh, they then uh, transferred me to their senior manager because it was a highly technical issue. And instead of me having to explain again what my problem is, the person I was talking to put me on hold, took three or four minutes to explain it to the senior guy. The senior guy comes on and says, I understand you have such and such a problem. Wow. What a concept. As opposed to calling Microsoft, which I used to do until I left the dark side in the 2000s. Uh, and uh, Microsoft wanted to charge me $195 to explain to me that I found one of their bugs. And I'm real good at finding bugs. I'm a product manager. So uh, we couldn't finish working on it. And I said, do you mind? Can you call me back tomorrow? He calls me back the next day. Instead of me having to call Apple, uh, or you don't even have to call Apple now. You go to Apple support, slash support, you put in your phone number, and you tell them what time you want them to call you, like right now or later or wherever it may be. It's wonderful. Uh, I had a MacBook uh, 2012 and had a graphics problem, and the, the monitors kept flipping. So I took it in and then replaced the, mother, the motherboard three times. And the fourth time it failed, uh, with some chips that they were getting from some supplier, I took it in and I said, "Yo, yeah, guys, this is the fourth time. The least you can do is give me a new computer. They said, okay. They gave it to me. I said, did you do that just because I asked? They said, no, that's our policy. Mm -hmm. So that's the thoughts that you have to keep into account as a product manager is what's going to happen in the support and service area. Uh, I'll never forget when I was running the Apple III product line, I wanted to do a promotion. And Donna Davinsky was my distribution manager. How many people know Donna? She later on went on to get a lot richer than I. Uh, she founded uh, Paul. And Donna says, well, we can't do that, permission, uh, that, that promotion because our man-man system from ASP won't allow us to do it. I said, change the system. The important thing is that we have to be able to sell these products and service and support our customers and run promotions. So that's one of the things that uh, is very critical to uh, understanding in the entire product lifecycle. The framework that I had on the previous slide, uh, that 
is uh, up on uh, the Spice Catalyst website. You can download it and use it. I also have broken out a clear job description for what a product manager does, which is typically the top part of that, and what a product marketing manager does. And it's somewhat along the lines of what Pragmatic says, you know, the inbound, outbound kind of thing. But a lot of things get confused. Uh, I've got a blog on my website about uh, job descriptions uh, that people are putting out when they're looking to hire a product manager or a product marketing manager. And uh, so they'll describe a lot of the things that a product manager does, which is the first set on the top there. And then they'll say, uh, customer demos. What? Uh, that's what you have the support, or uh, what do you call it, the field engineers do, that kind of stuff. OK, if you don't have enough people, certainly you may need to get involved in that. But if you look at these uh, uh, job descriptions, they got it all mixed up, which makes it virtually impossible for you to become successful. In terms of customers, I talked about this already. Understand what they do, then do your innovation, then identify your customer value, then the value proposition, and then the rest of the things you see around the slide, positioning and so forth. And in terms of employees, in addition to all of the things you saw on the framework that a product manager and or a product marketing manager needs to do, these are the additional things, core competencies that an organization needs to have. So I did a blog on this subject. It's called uh, Entrepreneur is Just French for a Product Manager Plus. And I got this great thing about entrepreneurship. And the New York Times on December 30th last year did a piece about the teaching of entrepreneurship at startups at colleges and universities around the United States and how that's exploded. And I analyzed all of the curriculums that I could find, including the one here at uh, Santa Clara University. I'm sorry, Santa Clara University. And they're missing 40 things that are essential to the successful management of products. As these are some of those. And if you don't believe me, just take a look at Kodak. Here, this company used to rule the film business. And now their debt value is less than a million dollars owned primarily by employers. And I remember I was consulting with Lexar Media. How many people remember Lexar Media? They make the little cards that go in your cameras. And we had a contract with uh, Kodak to license our digital film and sell it. Well, they killed the relationship because they thought it would threaten their uh, product, uh, uh, their film business. And of course, they did still film and they did movie film, motion pictures. And they dabbled in a few other things over the years and pretty much ate their own because after all, they weren't producing as much money in these little things that the big things are. So they define their business as film. But can you imagine if they define their business as the ability to capture and share images? They'd be the digital uh, video, movie, and images business big time. But they didn't do that. So the important thing is that your employees understand what the market is all about and understand the things that I've just uh, talked about. And the last thing is systems and tools that help you manage that entire product life cycle. And as a result of coming here, uh, you can get a free copy of the uh, productized uh, Jira plugin if you want uh, and give us some feedback on that. I want to leave enough time for questions. David, I have a question. Go ahead. My wife works for Barbara and Gail. She works in the research. And um, she has a lot of friends that are brand managers, one of them is a VP. Uh, we frequently talk about and compare contrast between my world and hers. Uh -huh. And you see a lot of similarities. We just kind of use a different lesson on, but pretty much very similar. Uh, what do you see elements of that world? Good question. You lack the authority. I argue that the product manager should have the budget for the product, which is then spent by the market research department to do the market research for you, which is then spent by the marketing department and doing all of the marketing. And that the product manager should be controlling that budget. The brand manager at uh, 
Procter & Gamble does that. And I was faced with this situation at Apple when uh, uh, the executive committee went off to Bahara Dunes and canceled my product line. A couple weeks later, uh, Ida Cole, who later went on to be VP of International for Microsoft, dragged me into an office with uh, John Scully, who was sitting at the end, Joe Graziano, who was the CFO, who was here. Uh, uh, Ida sat there, and Dal Yoko, who later became president of Apple, was sitting there. And John is looking at a spreadsheet, and he says, Dave, we've got uh, $20 million worth of piece parts spread between um, Singapore and Dallas, our manufacturing facilities, um, and you know, we canceled the product line. What should we do about it? I said, well, first place, the spreadsheet you're holding comes from Super Visicalc. That's on my product. I was a group product manager at that time. Second thing is, uh, you never asked me about it before you canceled the product line. When you hired me, you told me I had at least 18 months to turn it around. So I said, what do you mean, we, pale face? <laughs> and he didn't laugh. I said, oh, shit. Uh, so um, I explained the story to him, you know, the Tato and uh, Lone Ranger are going through the desert and surrounded by 10,000 yelling, screaming Indians. And Tonto, or Lone Ranger turns to Tonto and says, Tonto, we are surrounded by 10,000 yelling and screaming American Indians. I have to clarify that when I teach you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that uh, uh, all they want to do is scalp us. What should we do, Tonto? And Tonto says, what do you mean we, pale face? <laughs> so I said, you didn't ask me. He said, well, what should we do about it? I said, Give me the authority, and I'll make things happen along your lines. Because my mentor was a fellow by the name of uh, William S. Magruder that ran the supersonic transport program, former Air Force uh, test pilot for Boeing and Lockheed. Uh, and he uh, introduced me to and told me about uh, Kelly Johnson, the uh, Lockheed Snow Corps, and how they could quickly turn things around. And I was lucky enough to talk to Kelly a few times, understood what was going on. And then when I went into product management of HP, I read The Soul of the New Machine. And I also understood the history of the IBM PC, where they tried to get the PC, IBM PC developers as far away from Schenectady, New York, but in the same time zone as they could. So that's how it ended up with Boca Raton, just to get out from that bureaucracy. <coughs> Give me the authority, and I'll make it happen. So I organized a team of about 70 people at Apple, and we put together an 80-page business plan. I presented it to the um, uh, executive committee on July 15, 1983. And Maxine Graham, who worked for me, said, you know, one of the most important things we need to do, because she was on the Apple Values Committee, is we can tell them what the options are. And we came up with five options. We shut the product line down right now, let it go on until uh, the market decides they don't want to buy it anymore, and three other options in between. And we compared that to Apple's values of concern for the customer, empathy for the customer, and other Apple values, which we had been trained at when we, the first day at Apple University, when we first joined the company. Um, and at that point, uh, Floyd Kwame, who was executive vice president at the time, he later on would be a very famous VC of Kleiner Perkins, and was a consultant to uh, George W. Bush on technology. Floyd says to me, uh, if a dealer calls you, and we picked those options, what would you say? I said, if a dealer called me and you allow me to continue to manage the product line until the market decides, not us, because you're not smart enough to know what the market wants, um, I'll tell them that. And that also applies to you as a dealer. If you, uh, and I'll tell the dealer that. But if the decision here is to shut the product line down, which frankly would be screwing at that time about 50,000 of Apple's best customers, that paid on average seven or eight thousand dollars for the computer, the hard drive, and all the software that they were running their business on. If we told them no, then that issue of loyalty, for example, of uh, Apple values would be violated. So, Floyd, if that's what you tell me, I won't talk to the dealer. I'll give them your phone number. And the executive committee cracked up. And uh, a week later, I got a call and they asked me to run the product line. And the difference, the primary difference, is they gave me full authority. They gave me a budget, they gave me several people, they gave me the first floor of Banley 6. My office was about six feet from when I first met Bill Campbell on his first day at work at, uh, at Apple. And uh, we were able to sell 25,000 Apple III's, uh, shut it down with 3,000 left over. I sold them to uh, Sun Remarketing in Ogden, Utah on a bulk sale. We generated about $60 million in profits. 
And the profits from that product line was enabled somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 Apple people to work at the company because the Macintosh sales hadn't started yet. Lisa just shipped it. It was an abysmal disaster. Uh, the Apple II was struggling against the uh, IBM PC XT because it didn't have much hard disk support at that particular point in time. And sure enough, uh, a year later, 15, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 Apple employees were laid off uh, as a direct result of not exercising the ability to chase the cash cow. And the Apple III was a cash cow. And it represented about one-third of the profits of the company at the time. But Del Yoakum, the guy that was sitting there, his metric was units. We were doing about 3,000 units in his manufacturing facility, the Apple III. And he was doing 40,000 Apple IIs. He said they're getting away on the factor four. But an Apple II typically sold for about $2,000, had about a 20% margin. My product was seven dollars or $8,000, had a 40% margin. So if you look at it, we are actually one-third of the entire company run by 17 people. And they could have continued that for another two, three years and not cause all of those great people to leave Apple and go start uh, parts of Adobe, PageMaker, Sun Microsystems, Silicon Graphics, and on and on and on. I once identified about 100 companies that came from the people at Apple during those days. Because Apple always hired uh, A-plus players. And then they paid them 40% above everybody else in the valley. And that's been one of the frustrating things for me having left Apple is that I don't find many A-plus players to play with. It's not as fun when, you, when you're you know, uh, playing with C, C and C-minus players. Okay, so uh, if you want a free copy of the book, if you want the free use of, and or the free use of product guys, if you want the latest insights or you want to learn more, uh, then connect with me on LinkedIn. It's just in slash David Graham. And then send me a message saying that you were here and which of the things that you want. On my LinkedIn profile are all of my online courses. So tell me which one you want. I'll generate a coupon and send it back to you. Without knowing the email address, LinkedIn does not let you connect. Yeah. It's um, the reverse of what you're showing here. Oh, no. Uh, pick under how do you know this person and uh, pick uh, Spice Catalyst. And follow me on Twitter. No, I wouldn't do that. I think I've got my email address on here. Yeah, well, there's our blog. So go to the blog and subscribe to the newsletter. Spice Catalyst is yours. Yeah. And my email address is Dave at Spice Catalyst. Four letters. Mm -hmm. And if you take the course and you're looking uh, to get a job uh, for free, Courses are uh, what you're getting is uh, cost twenty to thirty dollars. Um, all of them include a workbook or a template, uh, which you fill out as you go through the course for your product. And if you don't have a product to do it for, I've got seven or eight I can share. With you. you can pick one of those. Um, and at the end, you get a certificate, and then I'll review what you do uh, uh, online, give you some feedback, and then if you do a really good job, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. So then you can take that workbook, the letter of recommendation, I'll also put it on your LinkedIn profile, go to a hiring manager and say, look, I know how to do product management. And here's some of my artifacts. So you were mentioning earlier that as a product manager, you shouldn't be doing wireframes. If you only have a one-person product management, or a one-person organization, a bigger startup, or two or three, how do you divide up the jobs? Because you still have, I mean, you can't have one person per role. Yeah, how do you uh, do that? That's difficult in a startup. Uh, at HP, we were given one product at the beginning of the product life cycle, and another product that was just about to be introduced. So we were doing, the first one was product management, the second one was product marketing. Uh, in a startup situation, uh, a designer, a user experience designer, that's a four-year career, four-year college. And to expect a product manager to be able to really know the nuances of that is very, very difficult. Um, if you have the money, hire a consultant that knows what they're doing and let them do the buyer. Right? Because if you have the money, things that you can use that are easy to use online that you can 
at least to get your concept across to the engineering team, you don't have to really be doing the user experience, but a lot of the time I do a visual thinking when we use these tools just to get that across. You have to do some level of wireframe. Yeah, and if you're copying somebody else who's already figured that out, great. To at least get started. That's a, that's a good solution. And then when it comes to interviewing potential customers and whatnot, <coughs> when it comes to interviewing potential customers and identifying who they, that is something that a product manager theoretically should do. Correct? Should be doing, yep. Okay. yep. Uh, a lot of times when I've taken over a product that's already been brought to market, uh, I was at a company called Video FX, which is the first desktop video editing system. They thought the product was targeted at uh, people that had Macintosh. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know anything about doing video. So I went to work for them. The first thing I did is went out and talked to uh, about 20 of my customers. Found out the value proposition for video post-production suites. And their, our little box cut the cost of their suite from $150,000 to $75,000. Oh, wow. So it was selling like hotcakes. But they had spent their entire quarter of a million dollars on their manuals to explain to Macintosh users how to do video. Yet our customers already knew how to do video. <laughs> uh, okay. So that's a classic example. I've seen that happen over and over and over. Yeah. 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 Yeah